Good morning, good morning everyone and welcome to your dawn safari from what is a clear moon but a very ominous grey sky coming in from the southeast. You're here in the northeast corner of magnificent South Africa, possibly the world's most beautiful country as voted for by South Africans. We're in the iconic Kruger National Park, which is 2.2 million hectares, just over 5 million acres of untrammeled wildlife wilderness wonderland. That's a lot of wobblies for this early in the morning. Also, off into Mozambique and north into Zimbabwe, part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. All the place names you're going to hear over the course of the next three hours will be deeply confusing. I may even draw you a map, which will leave you even more confused. Now, you are on a live safari. My name is James Henry. On camera today we have Brian the Thumb Joubert. Very nice, Brian. Thank you, James. What is the Thank thumb you. today? Just his normal tie? Yeah, I'm very excited as well. Yes, excited suit and tie on Thursday morning as we close into the weekend, which of course for us is exactly the same as every other day as it is for that little herd of wildebeest over there. On the other vehicle today, the inimitable Brent Leo Smith, his last drive before he goes on a well-deserved rest, uh, he unfortunately has a flat tyre again. Of course, he will tell you that he has never caused a flat tyre in his life, nor has he been stuck or ever broken a car. This, of course, is Piffle. He is being filmed by VM Dorenbrach, and on, in the final control today, Rebecca, I think, no, she isn't. Louise is talking in the ears, and uh, I think Chelsea, Chelsea Bunn is on the uh, uh, knobs, tapping on the keys. So you are most welcome, like I say, a live safari. That means you can talk to us as we drive through this wonderful area. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. This is a herd of wildebeest which we haven't seen around here for some time. I'm not entirely sure where they've been. Probably on Arethusa. They like to kind of move between here and the clearings of Arethusa, possibly up into Biffle's Hook. Now this is the same species that you see migrating in those vast numbers all over East Africa. It's a different subspecies, but the same species. Now I'm going to be very quiet because Brian's friends are calling from just over the backs of those wildebeest. So I'm not sure if you can hear that or not, but what we've got there are the ground hornbills incredibly rare birds, endangered species. Looks like a giant black turkey with a kind of red uh, red mantle around the neck. Brian, would you like to give us your impression? Mm. <laughs> That's Brian, everybody. <laughs> Talking to his friend, the hornbills. And the hornbills, there were six of them yesterday in a flock that Brent managed to find, which I think is rather magnificent. So you can see you saw the grey sky there and these wildebeest now picking on the last kind of bits of grass that they can find. For the grazers and the browsers, but especially the grazers after our very poor rainy season, they're going to have a bit of a tough time as we go into the really business end of the dry season. So I'm sure as many of you will know, this is a very much a summer rainfall area when it rains. Haven't We had hardly any rain this year at all. And these kind of clouds are a bit like, as I've said, in some of the South African politicians, uh, they promise much, deliver almost nothing. Uh, I guess that's politicians the world over. But they look like they're going to rain on us, and it would be highly unlikely that we get any winter rain. But I'm saying that, of course, just because I don't want to get wet and tempting fate to prove me wrong. All right, let's sneak a little bit forward. I think it may be worth spending just a few more minutes with these wildebeest and then we're going to head down towards the south west southeast and see if we can pick up tracks of Karula the great queen 12 year old female leopard and maybe her little babies four months old now almost five George and Charlotte not their real names the names I've given them were the guides of this area who get naming rights to find out that I'd call them George and Charlotte I'd be well I'd be a pariah more than I am already there they are. And knocking about with the wildebeest, a few fork-tailed drongos, which you can just hear making very quiet swizzling noises, and there are a few starlings in there as well, that have now obviously become invisible to the camera. There's one 
just next to peeping out next to the left hand side that's one of the starlings Hello, James Richard. Good morning to you. You want to know if buffalo and uh, other antelope are susceptible to diseases which might affect the development of their horns? I'm sure there are. I've certainly seen one or two buffalo with mangled horns in the odd impala with a horn growing in a, at a jaunty angle. I don't know what they are, though, James. I'm not sure what they're called. And, uh, yeah, I mean, any ideas that you could give me would be wonderful, but I'm really not sure what diseases would cause that. But certainly I have seen the odd buffalo, especially buffalo cows, not so often the bulls, with a, a horn that looks like it's not broken off, like it's sort of grown in a strange fashion. And, of course, we all know that once the buffalo and uh, antelope die out here, the keratophagus or keratin-eating moths lay their eggs in the buffalo horns and that eats away at the keratin and then well the the larvae eat away at the keratin and eventually well it gives the gives the buffalo and the antelope horns the appearance of dreadlocks and then the moths hatch and they go off and i think quite often that you know we see buffalo rubbing their horns and uh, sort of scratching the tops of their heads and i think a lot of the time that's put down as territorial behavior I think quite a lot of the time it's actually the buffalo scratching their heads because I think that those moths, I don't see why they wouldn't lay their eggs in the living keratin of a buffalo. So I wonder if they don't have the, you know, the eggs inside the keratin already and then they start, rub, they hatch and perhaps the buffalo get very itchy and so they rub their horns. Right, we're heading down into this ominous greyness of the dawn and we'll see if we can pick up some low powered tracks and just to keep you posted Brent not only has a flat tire he apparently also has no sing signal so he's doing um he's having a wonderful morning so far So the road, of course, is the bush newspaper. That's the kind of cliche we like to use, and it's a good one because it tells us what was happening during the night. You watch the road, you see what tracks there are. At this stage, some hyenas went bolting up that way sometime during the course of the morning. Some impala did the same sort of thing. Always there are civet tracks, and we, I always say we never see civets, and Brent saw one last night. That was really nice. A good parting gift for him. And just to keep you posted while Brent is gone, of course you know that Sam is not here, you know that Jamie is not here, and I'm sure you're wondering to yourself, who's going to help James? Surely we don't have to stare at him for six hours a day on his own for the next week. And uh, no, you'll be pleased to know you don't. Uh, sitting behind me and next to Brian, we have the, the f substantial figure of Byron Sorrell ex-south of Johannesburg. We don't hold that against him. Uh, that's basically where the gangsters of South Africa come from. Uh, he is not a gangster to my knowledge and he will be joining us from this afternoon. Hello Byron. There we go. You may have heard him say hello there. There he is. We have a sighting. Say hello Byron. Good morning everybody. <laughs> Look forward are. to seeing you all this afternoon. <laughs> Byron of course um, learnt some of the, his trade from me. Um, I gave him a little bit of training at the beginning of his career and then he forgot everything I taught him and became a very good guide. Go ahead Brent, I'm just going to talk to Brent. audio sounds of, uh, probably south of Trindam, so I think I Copy, I'm heading that way, thanks Brent. As is the rain. So you may notice a bit of spit coming out of the sky now, which is a bit disconcerting. It's starting to rain down here a bit. So what we're going to do is head down to the south. He says he can hear some lions. And we're going to just move along towards the center of the reserve and see if we can't pick up tracks of the lions. Maybe we can hear them calling. Maybe they'll cross over. And maybe the great queen and her babies will be around. Wouldn't that be nice, Brian? Mm. Yeah, splendid. I 
think there might be a nest in that dead tree for those green wood hoopoos. Some interesting green wood hoopoos. Taran, you're in Tanzania and you want to know if there are any animals here that are only found in South Africa and nowhere else in Africa. In other words, endemic animals. Um, Taran, in terms of animals, many. Remember, animals, of course, constitute everything from every arthropod and every insect and every arachnid to uh, the big mammals that we see. In terms of mammals, yes, I suppose you might consider the black wildebeest. I suppose he would be a South African endemic or Southern African endemic. Uh, two of the, the zebras, the Hartman's Mountain Zebra and the Cape Mountain Zebra, they're endemic to Southern Africa. So they will occur in Namibia, uh, not Botswana, um, but Namibia and the Cape of South Africa. So those would be two endemics from this particular area. Uh, plenty of birds, obviously, that you wouldn't find up in East Africa, but plenty uh, in East Africa that you would find here. And that's, I mean, that's an example there that we just saw, the green wood hoopoe. And the green wood hoopoe used to be called the red-billed wood hoopoe. You've always called it the green wood hoopoe. And it's one of the reasons that all the names have changed here, and they changed more than 10 years ago. But, and we still struggle to get used to it. But because the same bird often occurs in East Africa, the names have now been kind of, what's the word I'm looking for here, S searching my memory banks for. The names have been con consistentified, made consistent. <laughs> so, lots of animals that occur here. And then I suppose the springbok would also be another one endemic to southern Africa, which I don't think you get up there. It's our only gazelle species down here. You've got lots of different gazelle species up in East Africa. So those are that those would be three or four. It is uh, getting a little bit nasty weather-wise, isn't it, Brian? It is. We might have to go home for breakfast early. Brent, just to keep you posted, there is a uh, is down. The, the well, not him personally. He's up, but the, Wendy is down. Brian, I didn't bring my rain jacket because it's winter and it never rains here in winter. No, no. How many jackets today? Uh, just three. Just the three. Well, you might be able to stave off the rain with those three jackets. Anyway, the animals, as you can see, are hiding from us. So they don't enjoy this weather. Hello Zoe, you say have I ever noticed that the skulls of ruminants don't have upper incisors and apparently Aristotle made that discovery. Uh, Zoe, I suspect quite strongly that Ugg the caveman uh, more than 200,000 years ago probably realized that when he threw his first stone at a ruminant, knocked it dead and then devoured it. Uh, yes, you're absolutely correct though, the ruminants do not have uh, upper incisors. They've got a pad, they've got a sort of hard gummy pad. The incisor is only really a useful adaptation if you are cutting things with your teeth. And most ruminants you find pull the grass out. And buffalo are a great example, they use their tongues too. Uh, but goats and sheep, if you watch them eat, they bite down onto the, they sort of clamp the grass and then tear it. So they don't often sort of cut it. And that, I suppose, saves them a bit of energy. Thank you for that, Zoe. Uh, noticeable exception, of course, well, not ruminant, but definitely a herbivore, would, would be a horse or a zebra. They've definitely got both upper and lower incisors, and if you've ever been bitten by a horse, you'll know all about it. It's an extremely unpleasant experience. Brian, why haven't you asked me, James, have you ever been bitten by a horse? Have you ever been I have been bitten by a horse, oh, yes, yeah. Brian. It was very, very sore. Oh, no. Yes. I was a small boy. In fact, I've been bitten a few times. Mm. This is very unseasonable weather. 
it's also inspiring the animals to take fright and hide. Justin, you want to know what the terminal velocity of a raindrop is? Justin, as far as I'm aware, the term, and I may be wrong here, I'm going back to, I'm stretching myself back to my physics days. Terminal velocity is in the absence of friction, for example, so in, the, in a vacuum, terminal velocity I think is around 220 kilometers an hour and that in miles is about 140 miles per hour. So were a raindrop to fall out of the sky in the absence of friction, in other words in the absence of the air, it would fall at about 240 kilometers an hour. Now were there to be air in the way, I imagine there'd be quite a lot of friction, quite a lot of wind, so let's say the terminal velocity would be roughly two-thirds of that and so I'm going to put it at 240 uh, divided by uh, 3 is 80. I'm going to put it at 160 kilometers an hour which is 100 miles an hour. You can check that up for me though. What do you think Brian? Not bad. You think that that could be correct? Uh, potentially maybe. Potentially maybe. Oh, Google says 44 miles an hour for a hailstone, so probably about the same for a raindrop depending on the wind. So remember, it doesn't matter how heavy you are, if you're falling in a vacuum, you're going to fall at the same speed regardless of whether you're heavy, light, or shaped like, um, shaped like an arrow or shaped like a parachute. Right, we're on the southern boundary, everyone, to the right-hand side of the road, the, a property called Little Gari. To the front of us, a minibus van, how very exciting to see. And to the left of us, Juma. Those are guests, everybody, probably from Chitwa Chitwa or Cheetah Plains on the early flight out of Hootspreit or possibly from Nelspreit, so they're driving out early, poor people. No morning safari for them. Oh well. And we're going to drive very slowly along this road, just see if we can't pick up any tracks of leopard or lion. I'm just going to fix my earpiece because if it doesn't rectify itself I'm going to lose my temper with it and that's going to be very unpleasant for everybody. Isn't it Brian? Mm -hmm. Brian also has a buff on his head. Yes, I do. Yes. Two. Two buffs. Very nice. Now, Luisi in the final control, I'm on a handheld radio so your comms are getting a little bit fuzzy but they should be okay. Brent is still down, everybody. He's probably having his fourth cup of coffee. Telling a story, possibly about the man-eating lions of Tsavo. <laughs> when he hears I've said that, I'm going, to be in, I'm going to be in very big trouble. Now, Brent said he thought he heard some lions calling from here when he was fixing his tyre and braking Wendy's signal. So let's just turn off here and have a listen. The only thing I can hear from here is the delightful sound of the white-browed scrub robin going... I do not hear the throaty roar of a lion. Good morning, Officer. Oh, I do also hear Abel from Biffles Hook on the radio. Need to? Wipe the, lens. Wipe the lens. You do what you have to do, Brian. The people will understand. I'm afraid I didn't get that. Um... Yeah, Louise said I must wipe the lens as soon as ah, I said I must wipe right. the lens. I see. Okay, no sound of lions here. We're just going to give Brian a brief opportunity to quickly wipe the lens so that you will not um, feel like you have a migrainous headache coming on. You don't. It's just a bit of precipitation on the lens. The Franklins are calling. 
can hear them in the drainage line, their calls echoing through the trees. Yes, that should be okay, Brian. Should be all right. right. On we go. <laughs> Just keep an eye out on the road for any interesting tracks. Oh, I see a car up ahead that has looked like it had stopped, but it hasn't. I suspect strongly they are looking for what we are looking for. There are reports of the Queen crossing north into Juma here yesterday evening. Let's wait for these fellows to go past. And we'll get an update from them with any luck. They may just drive past me. Morning, how's it going? Good? Right, yes, they just drove past us. Oh well. Clearly there's no update. That's from Ankoro, everyone. Now, this is the great valley of the Mulwati drainage line, raging torrent that it is. And this is where Karula has been centering a lot of her activities while she's had her little babies. Yeah, what I think we'll do is we'll head north up what we call Leadwood Road here and see if she doesn't pop out somewhere there. Maybe she's killed some hapless antelope and draped it across a tree for us to look at. Uh, apparently she came north across here last night. I find that a little odd, I have to tell you, because it's a long way from where she was supposedly seen only half an hour before. So I'm not really sure what's going on on that front. Has been a little bit of rain, quite a lot of wind during the night, so it's going to be difficult to pick the tracks up. Now this is the road called Leadwood, so named, I think, because of this very tree here on our right hand side. And this tree has got in it at various stages a squirrel's nest and also the nest of a virtual starling, none of which have decided to grace us with their presence this morning. But on the ground, Brian, we have two ring necked doves, one of them looking very bedraggled. Now that is an iconic bird of the African wilderness. It makes the most lovely sound. And although the humble dove looks a peaceful sort of, um, I don't know, less than impressive bird, they are unbelievably fast. So one of the major predators, especially in, area, in desert areas, is, is uh, falcons. And falcons, you know, would, we were talking about terminal velocity, they dive at well over 200 kilometers an hour. And these doves somehow manage to get out of the way, take off and fly off at a speed that they avoid those falcons. Let us take a moment to appreciate the humble ring-necked dove. Jane, Jane. Go ahead. Brent is hailing me on the radio. What was your route? I did Weaver's Nest, Gary, Main. I'm now in Leadwood. Now that preening activity there, you can see the one behind is fastidiously putting his beak behind, or his or her beak behind the wing. There is a gland, an oil gland. There are a few oil glands around the bird's body, and it, one of them is behind the wing there. And they use that oil gland, of course, for this preening, endless preening that must take place. 
Now remember the feathers of a bird are not like your hair. They're not, once they're fully grown, the blood and nerve supply gets cut off, which means they're dead, which means that they cannot kind of self-heal, if you like. So if they get misshapen, the bird really has to be very fastidious about keeping the barbs in line. Otherwise, of course, as you know, with aeroplane maintenance, if you neglect aeroplane maintenance, you find your aeroplane plummeting out of the sky, and that doesn't end well. Same with a dove and any bird. Right, as this dove uh, wanders around the place picking up the old piece of seed and if it's very lucky an insect, Brent Leo Smith has managed to fix his car. Let's go and find out what he's going to be doing. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Of course, as James has just introduced, I am Brent and on camera with me today is VM. And uh, I cannot take any credit for fixing the car. I sort of dawdle about. Uh, it was the technical magnificence of Connor Teagues and Alexander Voz who has fixed the car. But now, James is checking down in the south. I'm going to check up to the north. Oh, hello, Sleepy. Oh, dear. What was that noise, Vim? Oh, the back door was not closed. Oh, someone's calling me. Morning, Abel. And we got some buffalo bulls here. Copy, thanks. Look at this. Now, that buffalo is slightly awake. The one to the right of us, oh no, now he lifts his head. <laughs> it was lying flat like a cat. This one was, had his head down on the ground. So this is the, the old boys club, the gentlemen's club. And they've had a bit of a tough time of it. Lions chasing them. Now, they're still in pretty good nick at the moment. Now, they're not going to move too far away from this area. Uh, the water's close by. They've got Gallego and Vuyatela Pan. So this is a good, good spot for them. And there's enough grazing around for them to keep going at the moment. But of course, as we move deeper into the dry season, it's going to become a bit more of a problem. Uh, while we leave these old boys to continue chewing the cud, you know, ruminate away. We're going to go look for the animal that they like least, which is lions. Now I'm hoping that those Inkahoma girls are going to be somewhere around the north. I'm also going to check past the last ping of Mr. Sindile, see if he's crossed back into Juma. Now wasn't it fantastic? We had such a wonderful civet sighting on the sunset safari last night. And I'm hoping uh, that we're going to have some fantastic big cats today. They seem to come out on my last drive before I head on leave. So hopefully today will be no different. The last time I went on leave on the sunrise safari before I departed, we had Kuda and her cubs. Oh, Viam needs to jump off the vehicle. I just want to move a little bit further from the buffalo. Here we go. We have having some door issues. So the back door that protects all our equipment. Here we go. You're going to hear a bang shortly, I think. There we go. A bit of no. We might have to cable tie it. You can hear VM. Ah. Now, of course, a lot of this stuff is just due to the amount of dust we have. Uh, dust gets into the locking mechanisms. And, and works its way through in the grease, and that's not working too well. Uh, we done? No? It was success. It was success. VM has had success, so we'll continue on. Now, it looks like we've come to the end of that cold front, although there was a bit of rain around. Hi, Ruth. Lovely to have you on the drive, Ruth. And Ruth is actually asking about something I'm very, very keen on. So, Ruth says, besides pottery, what other historical artifacts are found in South Africa? Well, Ruth, some of the oldest, oldest evidence of our ancestors. So there's a, a bit of a debate that's been going on for quite a while between East Africa and Southern Africa where the original origin of man is. 
And so I think at the moment the oldest, oldest hominin fossils are from East Africa. But the South African paleoanthropologists are quite sure that they're going to find older here. Now, of course, very recently there's been incredible, uh, some incredible discoveries made just outside Johannesburg um, by Professor Lee Berger's team. And actually, Professor Lee Berger was named National Geographic Explorer of the Year this year. And we'll chat a little bit more about those hominin fossils and that, but because James has got an animal with a heartbeat. That, everybody, is a sort of a blurry view of a bush behind which a diker just ran away, unfortunately. They're not very brave, I must say. But there are also quite a few birds singing around here. One of which is the crested Franklin, common bird, common morning bird, one of the very first in the morning to start calling. And there are starlings and there are magpie shrikes. So let's see if we can get some of the magpie shrikes. They're all sitting down over there. And there's one here too. And you can see some of them there. That one that's on the branch there has got a short tail. And that's because it's a youngster. It hasn't quite got its full length tail yet. And its call is very much that of an immature bird. Well, There's the sound of the golden-tailed woodpecker. You can hear some Cape Glossy Starlings flying past going, Cape Glossy Starling? Remember that, Brian? At least Byron? <laughs> and then there's a Birchall Starling sitting on the ground. There we are. Can you hear that swizzling? That's a Cape Glossy Starling, which is distinct from the Birchalls in that it is smaller and has a red or orange eye, not red, orange. You can even hear that golden-tailed woodpecker smashing his beak into the dead marula tree. Let's go a little bit forward and see if we can see him. They're not very common over here, those fellows. Many of you will not have him on your bird lists yet. He's in this tree here, Brian, this kind of leafless marula. Oh, there's a water buck up ahead. It's all happening here, Brian. No, I can't see the woodpecker. Let's go a little bit forward, have a look at the water buck. There it is, Brian, very daintily picking her way through the bushes. And again, you can see how I think most of the animals here are adapted color-wise for this time of year. Here comes another one. It's a great teeming herd migrating across the road, Brian. Majestic. Oh, and another. Good grief, there are three of them. But can you see how beautifully camouflaged they are, I think, for this time of the year, especially as they walk past the branches of that tree? Much less so when everything's green. But of course, when everything's green, they are, can hide behind the bushes. They can get into the thick stuff. That's marvelous. There you can hear that woodpecker again. but it's flying away from us. The rain seems to have abated everybody. The wind has dropped. It might turn into quite a nice day. Not sure what the weather prediction is. It was 14 degrees apparently when we went left camp. That's 54 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not sure I believe those weather reports though. We've had some ridiculous ones this year. This is why when people tell me there's a 70% chance that there'll be flooding this year, 
I say to them, you may as well be betting on a roulette wheel. If we cannot even successfully tell us what the temperature is going to be in one area at one time or tomorrow, how on earth can we predict regional weather over the course of months? Right, let's go back to Brent. He's found those two uh, silver-backed canids. Definitely one of my favorite little critters out here in the African bush, the side-striped jackal. And this is the pair that's been, well, sort of set up shop along the, so, uh, uh, the seep line from Impala Plains all the way through to Sydney's waterhole. Now, one of the reasons side-striped jackal in particular are so fond of this area is the amount of gory bushes. And some of them are still in fruit, very late fruiting this year. So they take advantage of that. So they are very much omnivores. And in certain parts of Africa, even 60% of their diet is made up of fruit rather than meat. Look at that. I had a busy night foraging. Now it's time to call into a warm little ball. Sorry, I thought I heard something in the distance, but I think it's a car. Oh, look at that. Now, you can see how well that, their camouflage works. And I mean, they're very vigilant little animals. But when they keep still and curled in a ball like that, very difficult to see. Now, I'm just going to move forward a little bit. And let's see, I think there might be some... Oh, it's all finished now. And literally... In a normal year, the whole floor around these bushes will be littered with, with little little fruits. But I've seen these jackal eating up, and they, the fruits are tiny. I mean, they're just a little speck. And they eat them a lot. And you, you, when you look at side-striped jackal's dung, you find a lot of fruit in it. In this area, mostly gory fruit, and of course, fruit of the African ebony or jackal berry. So let me try to get a little bit closer to the jackals. Here we go. Hello, little one. Hello, James. James would like to know if this pair of jackal decide to stick around, do they have a specific denning season or breeding season? No, like most of the carnivores, uh, James, they, they, they'll have babies throughout the year. And it is very likely we might see some jackal pups in the coming months. Now, they generally prefer to den in a, in a little hole in the ground, uh, sometimes in term mines, it's something, normally something a bit smaller and with not as much competition. They can have up to five pups at a time. It's normally around three or four, though. And those little guys will stay with adults till just under a year old before they move on to find their own territories. And they'll defend their territory quite vigorously against from other jackals. Now, one of the nice things about having the jackals around on a more permanent basis is we've got another alarm system. So they are very, very vocal when they spot a predator. Side-striped jackals are quite silent. They don't call a lot unless they spot a predator and they're like, Ow! Meow, meow, when they see a lion or a leopard. So it's always a very good one to listen, to, listen for in the bush. And they're very, very accurate. They don't alarm at nothing. If they start alarm calling, there's something there. Now, strangely enough, the strangest jackal alarm call I've ever heard. I was convinced there was a leopard around, but it wasn't. There was actually a python inside the den eating a pair of jackal's pups. And we heard them alarm calling. But now from a tiny canid to the second largest primate we have at Juma with James. There's a monkey, everybody. It's silhouetted a bit in the eastern sun, but I think I can't see any others, which I think is quite odd because they do occur in troops, of course. Maybe the rest of the troop is foraging on the ground below. 
and this is the sentinel sent out to look what's going on. I was rather hoping it would start shouting because it had seen a predator, but it hasn't started shouting. It's just sitting on a really thorny branch. I'm oft times very glad that I'm not a monkey when I see the kinds of trees they have to sit in. And it always makes me amazed when they jump around in a tree like that and manage not to hurt themselves. I don't know if they're just very brave or if their skin is just very tough. But he looks very comfortable up there. Let's move a little bit closer around the corner. Now we only get two monkey species here. The Samango and this one, the Vervet, not Velvet, Vervet monkey. It's a slightly better view of him. And baboon, when Brent said second largest primate, he was referring to the baboon as the largest. I suppose you could include us there somewhere. And there are actually many, many different kinds of monkeys in Africa, and I'm always surprised that we only get two of them out here. He looks very relaxed there, doesn't he, Brian? Mm -hmm. Not a care in the world. Mm. No. He looks a little bit glum. He does look a bit glum, but I suppose that's the weather. Mm. Not used to it, you know. I'll just give you an idea of how many primates there are in Africa. If you look here, there's the game drive radio. Let me just try and turn that down. Look at this. So here is a, a field guide of mammals. Uh, it's interestingly got the humans and apes on the same thing. It doesn't actually have a human. Um, but there they are. The gorillas, the chimpanzees, look at all of these monkeys, none of which we find here. They're all found normally sort of around the forested areas of the Congo Basin in Central Africa. Lots and lots and lots and lots, all of those, that whole section is just monkeys and primates found around Africa, which I think is fantastic. I just wish we had a few more of them here. It's not to cast any aspersions on you, my friend. Let's leave him there to his rather glum depression. He can contemplate life on his own. And let's move on. Now, Scout, you make the very good point, as I said. Um, you said you thought that monkeys hung around in troops. They do, almost all the time. So why that one's alone, I don't know. Like I'm saying, his troop could be foraging on the ground and he could just be there as a sentinel, sort of looking around as a security detail. Could be that he's a young male and he was thrown out of the troop by bigger males. That's possible. And we'll just give you a view now out over the west, to the west there, where you can see the sort of sky hanging low over the golden green of the tops of the trees. Is that not very pretty indeed, Brian? Mm. While we do that, let's go across to Brent and find out where he's going from his jackals. We're on the northern boundary and we're heading east. Now, I've just got a report that there's a male lion and three females inside uh, Buffalo's Hook to the north of us. So I'm not sure which lions they are. Uh, I'll wait till someone Gets, gives us another update. But if it is the Inkahumas, that means there's two lionesses missing. We know the one is Denning and Torchwood. So we are convinced that that other female is Denning somewhere in this area. It could be on Juma, it could be on Buffalo's Hook, but there's a lot of little river systems here that would make ideal den sites for that lioness. So if we have a look to the left here, You can see now, we're up on the crest. So as we go down, you'll see how the bush changes as we head towards the 
the bottom of the there we go you can see there's the little one of the little river systems and you'll notice how the bush gets much much thicker there and also they've got little ravines and little caves around those river systems that make ideal den sites for both lion and leopard so let's have a look carefully for tracks around here At the moment, all I see is an impalala. There we go. Nice little herd of imp imp impala boys. Hey, guys. Careful, there's a lion around here somewhere, we think. Not only is it a good area for lion and leopard to den when they've got babies, but during the drought, as you head down towards these little rivers, there's the last little bit of greenery left. And we'll show you now, there's even some green grass. So, of course, there's the water table all flows down towards these little rivers. So, have a look here. You can see there's still some greenery around. And it's going to attract a lot of the herbivores as well. Let's keep heading east. Now, Ruth was asking about South African artifacts, and we were chatting about uh, Professor Lee Berger, who's just won the Nat Geo Explorer of the Year. For the, his team discovered uh, possibly the first uh, the first signs of a communal burial and a new species of hominin that's been named Homo naledi. Naledi actually means star, and. Uh, very, very interesting stuff happening in that sphere. But literally, Southern Africa is littered with artifacts. And one of my hobbies is to look for these things. So, so those pottery pieces James had in the tent, uh, actually, I found some of them, and my dad found the rest. Uh, where we live, about 70 kilometers to the, the northwest of here. Hello, hello. Now, I'm pretty sure this is young Cinderella these tracks. This is where he's been hanging about. We've been checking the boundary here. There we go. And these are look like nice fresh tracks during the little bit of drizzle we had earlier this morning. So hopefully he's very close by. Now they've got, they've been rained on a little bit, but it was only raining for a short while this morning, very, very early. So we just check very carefully where these tracks go. So, while I'm watching these tracks... Where did he go now? Did he go that side, Ben? No, I think he went to the right. Let's just go back again a bit. So, here we go. There's his footprint there. Someone has driven over them earlier this morning. He's coming here. And he's just been driven over. We're going to check a bit further. So... As I was saying about all the artifacts we get, um, and stone tools, hand axes, uh, late Stone Age cutting tools, there's literally hundreds of things. Now, generally when you're looking for stone tools and that, it's, it's better to look closer to the major rivers. Ah, he's still here. Now, also wherever there's a bit of erosion, and so at the base of erosion section, because a lot of that stuff might be washed down. Let's just check carefully. Is that him or a hyena? That's him walking straight down the middle of the road. He's actually walking right there at the moment. Now he does enjoy a good termite mound, so. And keeping an eye on all the termite mounds around us. And his VM's got them on his side. As I said, these tracks are really nice and fresh, so he could be right here. You still got tracks, VM? Okay, I don't have tracks this side as well. Let's have a look in the middle. Just 
just have to go back there. I'm just going to check a little bit further forward. Ideally, what we want, we want these tracks to suddenly come out, but on top of the rain. That means we're mere, mere minutes behind him. What's that in the middle there, VM? I think those are his tracks again. No, those are hyena tracks. What's this there? Those are all hyena tracks, hyena tracks. Hyena tracks. Uh, let's just check a little bit further down, then I'm going to go back to the last tracks. Marsha's wondering if I think Singile recognizes his home area. Um, to, to a degree, I would, I would say so, Marsha. But also, at that age, he is sort of, as much as he wants to hang around, I think that last in encounter with his mother will show him that he's not really welcome anymore. And it is natural for male leopards of that age to, to move away from home. So where he has been hanging out currently is outside of his, his mom's natal range. He's in Karula's territory at the moment. Okay, so Vim and I are going to go back to where we had the last tracks. And while we do that and try to figure out which way young Sindile went, let's see what James is up to. James is approaching Bivol's Hook Dam, hoping that something will be thirsty after the cold night. Of course, this is, might be a, a spurious hope given that it's not very hot and hasn't been very dry. But we might be lucky. And maybe Sindile will just pop out of the dam. It'd be very nice. Then I think we might head towards the hyena den. See what's going on there. No further tracks of lions, leopards, any other kind of predator. So we'll just keep our, our eyes to the ground and see what turns up at the dam. Some elephant tracks we had, and they moved off towards the east, west, sorry. I cannot get that right. Every single time I say west or east, I mean the opposite and have to correct myself. One day I'll get it correct. Probably not. Anyway, let's pop down to the dam quickly and see what's there. Very autumnal, well, very wintry smell now we're getting. A little bit of moisture on all of the dry leaf litter that you can see around here. It's a really nice smell. It's a sort of a bush potpourri, if you like. Slightly scented, bit of dust, bit of petrichor. And that very nice scent of, the, I think it's probably the tannins in the leaf slowly kind of subliming or going up into the air evaporating. Right, we are now approaching the water. Thanks for coming. So there are some lions on Biffle's Hook, as I think Brent probably told you. Well, we don't know where the Nkohumas are at this stage. We think that's the Torchwood Pride that's up at on Biffle's Hook. So the Nkuhumas could well be around here. Their tracks have not come out again after we saw them going into this block to the west of Bivosuk Dam. Right, and there's a hornbill. Let us, given the lack of uh, huge predators, give credit to the humble yellow-billed hornbill. eating termites, probably, or ants. Can't see on the ground there. It always amazes me how accurate they are with that bill, which does have feeling in it. And if you ever, I mean, if you ever, I know this sounds ridiculous, but if you were to tie something that length to the front of your face and then try and accurately place the point of it 
onto something the size of a termite or an ant, I promise you, you wouldn't be able to do it. I think the coordination involved is quite stunning. Definitely found some colony of moving insects. I'd love to get out and look, but I'm not going to. I'm going to let him carry on eating. If he flies off, we'll have a look. Marianne, a nice question from you about starlings. And you say, are there any starling species in this area that are considered a nuisance as they are in various parts of the United States? Well, I think that the starling that you find irritating there in the US is in fact a European starling, so it's exotic. I've seen them in New York. It's definitely an ant nest there. That's wonderful to see. And Marianne, we get them in South Africa, not particularly, um, not in this area. They have become a nuisance in some areas. And there are one or two wild starling species that are a bit of a pain in uh, human settlement areas around, say, the Kruger Park. But that's just because they've got used to being fed by people. But they're certainly not a major nuisance, a major pest. A major pest bird in South Africa is something called an Indian miner which is quite closely related to the starlings. And we've seen some at Arethusa Dam, actually. That's the only time I've seen them in the Sabi sand, but they do come in every so often. And the Indian miner is a real menace, especially in urban areas. It is unsurprisingly, given its name, from India, where it is kept in check by natural predators. Right, here we are at the water's edge. Oh, look at that, Brian. We've got hippopotamus action. Oh, let's have a look at these hippos, and then I will consider Dina's question. Dina, you say, does the length of the bird's tail uh, affect its balance, or does it sort of counterbalance the beak? No, I don't think so. I think that tail is purely for... I'm just trying to think about that. You know, it's so light. I think it's probably almost negligible weight. It's largely used for flying. Now, this is not ideal hippo habitat. You can see the water is starting to dry out here. And these are probably two young hippos. There's certainly one young one. Maybe, another, maybe a cow. But possibly two young males who've been tossed out of a bigger pod in some more permanent water. Let's have a look there. It's quite a peaceful little scene. But those hippos are really in the mud there. But they're very... Uh, one of them is blowing bubbles. Can you see that, Brian? The one closest to us is blowing bubbles off the right-hand side of his mouth. Obviously he stopped, as I said it. Very peaceful little scene. And above us, the red-billed buffalo weavers continue to build their little nests or live in them. But otherwise, a fairly predator-free zone. Right, so you can see the dam has been expanded as well. And that is in waiting for this deluge that might be coming this year. So the dam will, A, not be sort of moved away and water will be stored. No alarm calling birds, no alarm calling anything here. So I think let's press on and see what we can find. We're going to go down towards the middle of the reserve now and see if we can head to the hyena den. Perhaps they are being a little bit more confiding than the leopards and lions so far. This 
So let's go across to Brent and get an update on his tracking of Sundile. It'd be marvellous to see him again. Unfortunately, not the best news about young Sundile. He went to the north. That doesn't mean he's not going to zigzag back to the south. So we're going to keep checking down the boundary. Sorry, I should be on the radio. Um, between Gary Katla and, and Timbuti Dam. Oh, hello. Well, good thing I didn't wonder about too much. I actually walked into some buffalo, and now just on the other side of the crest, inside Buffalo's Hook, there was some elephant, but quite deep in the thicket there. Hello, madam. Now, she's keeping very still. I think she's probably just listening to us. But the rest of the herd sound like they're quite deep inside Buffalo's Hook, so we're going to leave them be. So do elephants ever lie down when they sleep? And they do sometimes, Katie. It's normally the young ones. Uh, the adults find it And they will, if the adults lie down, they don't normally lie against something, a termite mound, oh, excuse me, a tree. And these elephants have come from here and they've crossed the road going north. Some even love inside Buffalo's Hook uh, on the crest between Timbuti Dam and uh, Gauri Cut Line. Okay, so I'm just trying to make sure that young Sindile, and if you're not sure who Sindile is, is a young male leopard whose tracks we were following there, but this tracks went north, hasn't sort of zigzagged back to the south. This is a good spot. He might have used the roads here to cross. Now, a lot of the roads are built on old animal paths. That's why we find tracks on them so regularly. Well, not this one. This is the boundary between two properties. That's why it's so straight. So here we go. This is where we want to check very carefully. Interesting. Let's have a quick look on that softer soil there. It's a very hard soil, so it's quite difficult to see the tracks there, but it looked like it was worth another investigation on the soft soil. Now, there are leopard tracks, but they look way too big to be his. Uh, unfortunately, we, we're not going to be able to show them to you in this light. They're, they're quite difficult and quite hard ground. Okay, now they're heading straight. Let's see if he comes onto the road. Oh, now to confuse matters, there's lion tracks as well. And those look a bit old. Oh, maybe not. It could be one of those lionesses that we think might have a dinner. Wendy, Wendy needs a good beating as far as I'm concerned, a thorough beating, and if that doesn't work, we'll probably give Connor a thorough beating and see if that doesn't fix the signal problem on Wendy. She 
It certainly has been a recalcitrant old bag over the last little while. Very poor signal indeed. We'll try and sort it out. I do think that the weather makes a huge difference. I'm sure when the pressure changes come, that signal is affected. And I have found no tracks of any large predatory animals. We are now in the valley of the Great Mulwati. Buffalo tracks, everyone. Do you think we'll see a buffalo, Brian? Maybe. That would be something. We did see a hippo. Oh, and there's a crombeck flying in there. Oh, some chagras. It's all happening here, everybody. There's a bird party. None of which are visible, of course. You see one in there, Brian? Are you? Oh, yes. That's a chagra, everyone. That looks like the black-crowned chagra. Beautiful call it has. In fact, it is the brown-crowned chagra. That's really cool. Very nice. You may also have heard the cheerful and uh, peaceful call of the chin-spot batis going... <whistles> and like I've said to you before, anyone who says to you that that sounds like three blind mice is tone deaf. Not so, Brian. You are not tone deaf, of course. No, some are. <laughs> Jim Butler, you want to know if we get the southern ground hornbill in our area? Yes, we absolutely do, Jim Butler. We had southern ground hornbills calling this morning. Brent saw six of them yesterday, which is an unusually large flock. But we absolutely get them here. They were making their call this morning, Brian. Yes, hornbill, please. Mournful, mournful call that they have, Jim Butler. Yes, we definitely get the southern ground hornbill here. Highly endangered. Much research going into trying to save them. We think that one of the reasons they're so endangered, well, one of the theories is, and I'm beginning to give less and less credence to it, is that the lack of large trees is... Uh, Mean, it means that there are just simply not enough nesting sites. So it's a huge turkey-like bird which lives in, a, in a, a tree hole, a cavity in a tree. And one of the theories was that because there's so many elephants now in the Kruger Park, well, the elephants are pushing over all the trees and so there's simply not large enough trees left for them to be in. And I don't really subscribe to that. I think they've lived in the presence of elephants for many, many years millennia. That is not a southern ground hornbill, that is a kudu. And it is just chewing one or two leaves off a very mangled combretum or bush willow bush. There are two kudu here, as I can see. There are probably a few more of them knocking about. They're most elegant. Ah, now Joe, you're in Australia, and you want to know if we get something called a hartebeest out here. We do not get the hartebeest at Juma. Uh, it can be found, the red hartebeest can be found in the Kruger Park. Uh, it's not common, but it can be found here. There they are. That is what a hartebeest looks like. These are all different subspecies of the hartebeest. And the one that you find out here is, that's interesting, I didn't realize there were so many of them. Uh, it is this one here, that fellow there. I'm not convinced of these drawings, Brian. Mm. My look, they look a little bit like I did them. Mm. 
almost as good as your maps. Almost as good as my maps, yes. Anyway, that's the Hartebeest. It is supposed to be found in the Kruger Park, but like the Sesebe and like the Sable and the Rhone and the Eland, they've all been adversely affected by the provision of artificial water. And I think you'll find, if we're going back to the Grand Hornbills, Jim, that the provision of artificial water has concentrated elephants in certain areas, which may well have affected the larger trees and therefore inadvertently affected the ground hornbills. And this is a classic example. I mean, I'm not saying that that is the case, but it's certainly possible. And it's a classic example of a human intervention, making an intervention, thinking, not understanding all of the variables, thinking that something is going to help the animals and having all sorts of unintended indirect consequences. Jim, another one from you, you're saying, why are some antelope species more calm than others? Jim, I'm not sure that they are. I suppose the really little ones, the Steenbock and the Diker, are much less calm, simply because I guess they're that much more vulnerable as being so small. Um, so, okay, here's, here's, here's a sort of biological answer. I think that a, a Steenbock and a Diker, once it knows it's been spotted, because its defense is staying hidden, it's going to run. Whereas an impala has a very obvious flight or fight distance or flight distance. You know, in, and if you go within that distance, it's going to run away. But it knows that you've seen it and it knows that the predators can see it. And so well, if you're within that flight distance, it's going to run. If you're outside of the flight distance, it won't. So their defense is vigilance and seeing predators around them and then maintaining the flight distance. Whereas the defense for the smaller antelope like the diker and the steenbok is to hide and once they think they've been seen well they go so that would be my answer jim right let's go and get an update from brent who seems to have found a lot of tracks around the place found where that lioness has gone off the road Uh, we found where that lioness has gone off the road and she's gone into this river system here between Hyena Road and Buffles Hook Dam. There's a strong possibility she's got cubs around here somewhere, but I'm not going to go walk right in there just yet. I'm going to have a quick look down Hyena Road, see if she possibly pops out down on Central. And the one problem with this area, which is great for her, uh, in terms of her den site, it's nearly inaccessible by vehicle. And quite often the big cat dens are in those inaccessible spots because there's no reason for a hyena or whatnot to go looking around there. very carefully. Just want to see that little tawny blur of movement. Kitty cats. Very thankful the wind's not howling today. Don't mind it being a little bit chilly and overcast, but oof, that wind, it's a killer. I think she's there where those big trees are down there. There's a big termite mound that's got some caves on it. I've walked in this area quite a bit. So there on that set, section of trees down there, that's where I think she is. Oh, it's a very likely spot for her to put a den. 
There's a little gorge there. It must be 20 foot deep. Remember, we are on a live African safari. And if you want to ask me any questions, feel free to do so. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email questions at wildearth.tv. So I think we've done, given the north a fair bash this sunrise safari. I'm going to start heading a bit south. Seems like the gremlins live on this road this morning. Apologize, apologies for that. So while we move out of the gremlin zone, Let's go see what James is up to. I think at the moment Brent lives in the gremlin zone, everybody. I'm not sure why Wendy's being so nasty. I've just seen Connor. He was driving around now. I beat him severely with a sharp stick. So we'll see if uh, Wendy isn't better by this afternoon. Now, we are... Oh, very gently moving along this road on our way to the Hyena Den, which is not far from here. This is Mvubu Road. Now, as I was, <laughs> we were talking about it just now. Um, just now, of course, let me just explain that term, which I use quite often. Just now is a South African term that to the rest of the world is utterly nonsensical, but it means uh, a little while back. Or it actually means a little while back, or it means we just now, right now. Soon, soonish, just now. I'll do it just now. That means that I'll, kind of, I'll get to it when I can. Anyway, well, I was using it in the past tense there. Just now, we were talking about the different languages that people use in this area and this road is called Mvubu Road and Mvubu is a Zulu word for hippopotamus. There are no Zulus in this area. There have never been any Zulus in this area and so the use of the term Mvubu in this area is strange. Likewise when one listens to the radio there's this game drive speak that people have and it's developed a kind of life of its own. It's, it's turned into this odd mixture of languages between Shangan, Zulu, English, and Afrikaans. And when I listen to it, it um, I'm, I'm a bit of a, a language snob, I suppose. The inside, my insides turn to liquefied mulch. It, uh, it, it's, like, it's like that chalkboard feeling, you know, when you scrape your nails down a chalkboard. That's how I feel when I hear some of the language spoken on the radios here. The ha ha ha. So I'll give you an example. <laughs> if, you find, if you find a pride of lions eating a buffalo, uh, you don't say, I found a pride of lions eating a herd of buffalo, uh, eating a buffalo. You say, I found a schlumby of Ngala puzzering the bumba. Now, if I was to translate that directly into English, it would mean I found a herd of lions drinking a kill. No, sorry. Stations, uh, yeah, I found a herd of lions drinking kill. Not a or the, drinking kill in, other, in the verb to kill. And there are three different languages put in there. Three different languages put in there. Shlambi, which is a very bad, um, very bad sort of a, a pronunciation of the word nklambe, which means herd. Uh, a, so a herd of lions, not a pride of lions, a herd of them. 
uh, Ngala, which would be just the singular, though, of, of the Shangan word for lions. Puza is to drink in Zulu. And they just tack on the English thing for ing, the... the <laughs> they just tack that on to the end of a Zulu verb, puzaring. Puzaring and bamba is the verb to kill in Zulu, not shangan. And it's not a noun at all. So, shlambi of Angala, puzaring a bamba. There is a hyena. <laughs> Hello, PK. You said most of the hyenas moved back to the Hendry Holiday Hyena Home. That is four alliterations. Well done, PK. I don't know. We know that one of the low-ranking females moved back here. I've seen this youngster lying away from the area before as well. There's another vehicle here, so I'm going to assume that there is a little bit of activity here. And certainly a number of the other hyenas did come by here. But whether they've taken up residence again, I don't know. I think they have. The next youngest, of course, remember, born in January. I've been away from them for so long, or they've been away from us for so long that I, I don't know who that is. But somebody on the Juma Arethusa hyena group will be able to tell you which hyena that is. Bit of a limp. But limps like that will not affect a hyena. I'll get by with them. And as I say that. A shlambi of Ndlov was just called in on the radio, everyone. That means a herd of elephant in two languages. Scout, do you want to know if we've seen the new ones yet? Have we seen the little babies just yet? We have, but only twice and they're probably only now about a week old. Let me just stop here and find out what Andrew wants to do. We'll just let him stop. In his very vast land cruiser. So I can see the mother there, Scout, but I don't see the little ones. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, then go. Okay. Can ease our way in here. Now, I'll tell you why I think she's a low-ranking female now. She's definitely not the matriarch. We know the matriarch. Her name is Madam. Oh, thank you so much for that. And it is normally, it's normal that one of these sort of outlying dens will become the home of a low-ranking female when she gives birth. And then once, once the cubs are of a certain age, normally about sort of six weeks, she'll move them across to the central den. Now, I'm not convinced that this hasn't become the central den again. And Andrew was just saying there that he's, the other hyenas, the rest of the clan, seems to be down in the drainage line, just where we saw that other lot going. At least her head is up. We'll, just, we'll go and have a look down in the drainage there, but I wonder why they're not hanging around here. 
The January ones, of course, now almost six months old. So, and they do grow. I mean, well, I guess they grow about the same speed as a leopard, but they are born slightly more developed. And so they don't need, perhaps, the cover of the den site. I thought I saw a bit of movement there at the back. Maybe not. So there, at least, there's at least one tiny little baby cub in there, only about a week old now. So let's sit, just sit, we'll sit here for another five minutes or so, and see if we don't have something sticking its head out there. Otherwise, we'll press on and see what else we can find. But you can see around here that the little pathway is leading around the den site, up to it, especially around the holes, have been well used now. So it's definitely more than just this hyena that's been here. And we have seen at least three or four of the smaller ones around here. But whether the whole clan has moved back here, I'm not so sure. It's a great sighting, that would be, at least, uh, Brian. Of one ear. Mm. <laughs> you know, we, we get so familiar with each other, everyone, that, uh, you know, we all start to look the same. Don't we, Brian? <laughs> you know what I mean, Dave? I do rather wish she'd call her babies out. That's it. Stick your head in. Get up. Perform. You're on TV. Come on. No. Now, a very, very warm welcome to the Grade 2 classroom at uh, Rodin School for Young Girls in Johannesburg. Uh, Mrs. van der Merwe and Mrs. Gonzales, welcome back again. I last saw you two days ago, I think, uh, and my little cousin Gracie is no doubt in the class, as is Mia, daughter of the father of all of this lot, Mr. Graham Wallington. You're most welcome. That hyena, of course, is very scared of you. It's gone running back into its den. Girls, what did you say? Why has it gone back into its den? Now, you see it movement there. You see it licking. We're going to sit here for a little bit longer, and maybe we'll be really lucky to see some little baby hyenas coming out. We have to be very patient in the wild. It's very important that when we do move, we move slowly, and you've got to do a lot of waiting. Because often, waiting is the way to find animals. Now, while we wait and see, if this little hyena baby doesn't stick its head out of that hole, just remember that you can ask us any questions you like. Your teachers will send them through to us and we'll do our very best to answer them. Often I find young children like you ask questions that are so clever and so difficult to answer that I learn as much from a lesson like this as you do. So any questions you like, send them through. My name is James, by the way. And on camera we've got Brian. And Brian's got a special friend, don't you, Brian? Yeah. What's his name? Thumb. <laughs> there is Brian's thumb, and that's his work uniform. You see Brian's thumb? That's his safari uniform. And he's, he's helping us find the animals out here. On the other car is my very tall friend, Brent Leo Smith. So let's head across to him and say hello. And we're just going to sit here for another sort of five or ten minutes and see if the babies don't stick their heads out. Welcome, Rodi. Nice to have you on Game Drive again today. So, uh, hello, Gracie. Hello, Mia. And hello, Savannah. And guess what? I'm going to co be coming to meet you all tomorrow morning, so I'll get to know all the class, not only the three. So very exciting stuff. Jamie and I will be coming to say hello to you. Oh, no, not tomorrow morning. On, what is today? Today, Thursday. It is, yes, tomorrow morning. 
when we live in the bush, we forget what day of the week it is because <laughs> every day is an adventure. So we don't have weekends and stuff. We are out in the bush all the time. So great to have you guys with us. I hope you've got lots of questions ready and hopefully James and I will be able to answer all of them. Now, what we're doing at the moment, I'm hoping the Rodin leopard luck is going to last and I'm looking for a female leopard who's got two little babies. But no sign of her just yet. So send all those positive thoughts to us so we can find a leopard for you, so we can show you a leopard on every one of your drives. But while we look for the leopard, let's go see what James is up to at the hyena den. The hyena, I'm afraid, has just hidden its head down there inside the den, so I don't think we're going to see a little baby. Now, you don't have a very long time with us, so I think we're going to leave here and see what else we might be able to find. Okay? Uh, so just keep watching. As I start the engine, she'll probably lick, lift her head up, but I don't think the babies are going to come out today. Maybe a bit later. Yeah, no, she's just sleeping down there. She only lifted her head because we started the engine. And that's not great. We don't want to disturb her. So let's leave here and see what else we can find. I do hope we have our luck with us. Last time, of course, I was with you. We saw two little baby leopard cubs. There, 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 there. Look at the rest of the hyenas there. That's the rest of the clan, everybody. There's some little ones. What we're gonna do, I'm just gonna try and move around a bit and see if we can't get a slightly better view of them. I'm pretty sure we will be able to. I didn't think that they were around. There's some very small ones in there. Not quite as small as the little ones in the termite mound. Let's just drive very slowly. We're gonna try and not make too much noise. Just going to go around here. Ah, I see they're going down into the drainage line there. Drainage line, everyone, is a dry riverbed. And we're just going to keep our distance because if we make a big noise, if we hit a bush or something and sound like an elephant, they're going to go running away. Because the Land Rover, as you know, or as you know, all cars are big and they can be noisy and they don't smell quite like a hyena. So they smell very strange to these hyenas got very powerful not noses. Uh, let's stop over here. Now, Mia, while we look at those little ones, you want to know how old a hyena can grow up to be. A hyena doesn't live very long, you know. Probably only about 12 or 13 years. And that's because life is tough out here. That's a hyena mother with her two cubs. I think those were the cubs, if I'm not mistaken, born in January. That's that's the matriarch, I think. I think that's the matriarch, madam, and I think those are her, her two cubs. So Mia, probably only 12 or 13 years out here, but... You know, in captivity, life is a bit easier. So, so if you have a hyena in a zoo, for example, you probably find that they live for up to 20 years. But out here, life's a bit tough, and the life, you know, strains of being physical and having to fight each other for food and fight lions for food that takes its toll on their lives. Now, when I say matriarch, do you all know what a matriarch is? A matriarch, everyone, is a female who is the leader of a group. And there are two societies out here that are matriarchal. One, the hyenas, and two, the elephants. And in the case of the hyena, their queen or their matriarch, who is this hyena we're looking at now, she, does, she leads everything. She is more dominant than the males, so she tells all the males what to do. It's probably a bit like a... Your, your mothers tell your father what to do, I'm sure, sometimes. And sometimes the other way around, poss poss possibly. But 
with the hyenas, it's always the mother that tells the males what to do. The males are smaller than the hyenas. Now, you know from just about all the animals you've ever seen before that the male is normally bigger than the female, just like with human beings. Well, the hyenas, it's different. And so she is the dominant. And she tells everyone else what to do. And all the other females are beneath her. So she's a bit like a royal queen. Now what I'm going to try and do is sneak a little bit closer once they've got used to us. What you do here, everyone, is you drive slowly closer and closer so that they don't get a big fright when you get close to start with. And we move very slowly because the slower you move, the less threatening you are. See, if they do get a fright, they'll just go running down into the riverbed there and then we won't see them again. So we need to move very slowly. But these hyenas, I know when they were at their last den, they used to come right up to the car. But because they don't have the protection of a den around them now, they might just run away. So we'll be very careful. Isn't that nice? I think that's fantastic. Now we recognize this female hyena from the fact that her ears are a bit mangled. Can you see that? They look like they've been bitten or that she's run through a thorn bush. And that's simply because she is the matriarch. She's quite old now. Well, she's probably about nine years old, I guess. But she will have a fight over food. Hyenas are not very good at sharing. So when they find something to eat, they fight with each other. And that's why their ears get bitten. <laughs> now, Cachet, nice question from you. You say, do I ever get lost in the game reserve? I don't anymore. I certainly used to. You know, this is kind of an area I've been driving around for a while now, and so I know it very well. And therefore, even if it's cloudy or nighttime, I'm, I can see where I am. But if you come to an area for the first time, so my first few months here, yes, I used to get lost all the time. But that's okay, it's quite fun to be lost. Because finding your way back home is a journey of discovery. But you do need to be careful in a wilderness area that you have an idea where you are always. Because you don't want to get lost in the wilderness with no idea how to get back home or back to camp. A lovely sighting of hyenas. I'm very lucky to see this, especially as they aren't in the den. I'm just keeping an eye on the den site. And I don't see the little ones out yet, just the mother. So they're suckling, and they might look a little bit big for suckling. And hyenas will suckle sometimes for up to a year. Now that for a carnivore, is a very long time. You all know what suckling is, of course. And leopards, little baby leopards, will probably stop suckling at a, almost, uh, almost, just after three months old. They'll start to, they'll stop suckling. Baby lions, about six months, maybe. These hyenas, which are about the same size as a leopard, much longer. All right, let's head across to Brent and see if he's had any luck with the leopard tracks. Welcome back. We are, welcome back. We are checking for leopards. This is near where we saw that first leopard on the first drive. So I'm hoping to find some footprints, but no luck yet. But it is a beautiful morning. I'm going to go head towards a water hole, see if there's anything there. Now, if you can, in this beautiful light this morning, you can see all the different colors on the leaves as they're changing. 
and soon a lot of these trees are not going to have any leaves. Oh, hello little ones. A little family of Natal Franklins. Oh, that's a very good mommy uh, to raise that many babies. I actually think there are two mommies there. So they normally only have two eggs and they nest on the ground so the eggs are very very camouflaged so they can't be found by things like mongoose and even leopards will eat the eggs it's always good when you're in the bush you must just switch off and you keep quiet you never know what you might hear quite often your ears find animals before your eyes but at the moment all we can hear is the birdies so what we're listening for is an alarm call. Now, if an impala sees a leopard, he tells all the other impala that the leopard's there. He goes, pff, 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 pff. Now, if a kudu sees a leopard, a leopard, he also tells all the other kudus, but he goes, bah, bah, bah. And what that does is it tells all the other animals that there could be a lion or a leopard around, that they must be careful because there's predators. So that's when we switch off and we listen. That's mostly what we're listening for. Now when lion and leopard are moving and hunting, they don't make any noise. But when they're trying to tell all the other lions and leopards that this is their place and they mustn't come here, they roar. Now, they've got very different roars. A leopard roar sounds like this. <coughs> oh, and a lion roar sounds like this. Both males and females roar, and what they're doing is telling all the other lions and leopards around that this is their territory, it's their, it's their home, and if they come there, they're going to be in trouble. Sometimes they'll also use it to find each other, but most of the time it's roaring to let all the other lions outside of their area know that they mustn't come here. Now this is a very good habitat for leopard that we're moving into at the moment. And we're looking for leopards, so this is a very good leopard habitat. So you've got lots of these little river beds like this, and we call them dongas. So there's quite a lot of nice deep dongas in this area. There's thick bush on the edge that the leopards can hide in. And even now, in the winter months, when a lot of the trees are leave, losing their leaves, a lot of these trees around here are going to have leaves. So some nice shade if it gets hot for the leopards to sleep in. There's water close by. Now, leopards don't actually need water. They can survive without ever drinking water. But if there's water available, they'll drink it. Now, one of the trees that you always find in these type of areas is this tree here. Now this is a tamboiti tree. It's actually a very poisonous tree. I'm just going to pick a leaf. And you want to be careful when you pick tamboiti leaves. Oh, we're definitely in a drought. That one's got... Let's try to find a better one. Okay, let me just tear it. Maybe that's the answer. Okay, there we go. Now, I'm going to get VM to show you. You see there's a little white spot there. Now you've got to be very careful of that little white spot. That's very, very poisonous. So the Timbuti tree has this milky latex that's inside, or mil milky, milky sap. It's very, very poisonous. Now, if you even had to cook on a fire that's from Timbuti wood, you'd get really, really sick. Now, the other thing you can use this for is if you've got any warts. Uh, you can actually put the Timberti juice on the wart and it'll burn it off. So this will burn your skin. Now certain animals use it as medicine. Baboons, black rhino, kudu, even elephants and giraffes sometimes. If they've got <coughs> lots of bad hohos and worms in their tummies, what they do is they eat the poison and it clears out their whole tummy of all the bad things. So it's 
bush medicine for some of the animals. So we're very close to the waterhole now, so let's go see if there's anything there. Okay, so we're nearly at the water hole. It's just up ahead. So, are you guys thinking leopard? I'm thinking leopard. Vilma, are you thinking leopard? We're all thinking leopard, so hopefully the leopard will be there. Okay, we're coming to the water hole. And... No leopard. Oh, well, they must be around the next corner then. And so while we keep checking for the leopards, what have you spotted in the water, Vim? Nothing. Nothing, Vim, just having a look. So we're going to keep checking for the leopards. Uh, while we do that, James is still with those wonderful hyenas. Now, everybody, look how pretty the light is. Isn't that beautiful? And that's one of the reasons I live out here in the wilderness. It's because there are so many pretty scenes like this. And the sun has just broken through the clouds. And you can see it's warming the two hyenas who, just like you, they don't like to be cold. And so they, I'm sure when you have break time there at Rodine, you run out onto the field and will sit on the steps in the sun. That's exactly what this hyena is doing. You can see how happy she looks. And you saw there, as her head flicked back, it was because she fell asleep. Just like you sometimes in the afternoons when you're sitting at your desk and the sun is streaming through the classroom on a cold winter's Johannesburg day and your teacher is talking to you and sometimes it's difficult to keep your eyes open. And that's exactly what happens with these hyenas. Just the same as us. Now oh, she's fast asleep. Now you might think to yourself, this must be quite dangerous because she's lying on the ground there. And there could be lots of um, there could be lots of other predators that want to come and maybe harm her because I don't know that I would lie on the ground quite like that in the middle of the wilderness. But she's a very dominant predator, and the hyenas out here are only dominated by the lions. And the word dominate means that they're they're only beneath, if you like, they're only beneath the lions. Only a lion can challenge a hyena. Now, Billy. You want to know how many different kinds of hyenas there are? Well, in this area, Billy, there are two, but the other one, the brown hyena, we very, very seldom see. We hardly ever see it. In fact, it's only ever been seen once here on Juma. But we get in the world, you get three or four different kinds of hyenas, and I'll find you a picture of the rest of them. The striped hyena is another that lives up in East Africa largely. We also get something called an aardwolf. Art wolf, which basically means earth wolf, but it's actually a hyena. And they are found also supposedly in this area, but I've never seen one here before. But only the spotted hyena lives in this group of matriarchal society. It's the only carnivore in the world, as far as I'm aware, that lives in such an amazing society. So, Brian, here are the other ones, if you want to just show the ladies at Rodine. There's a spotted hyena. That's the one we're looking at now, of course. There's the brown hyena. Now, many of you will know what Delta Park is. When I say Delta Park, you know where Delta Park is in Johannesburg. A brown hyena was found there about, oh, I don't know, about a year ago, I think it was. It was spotted there in Delta Park. So they're able to live just about anywhere, which is amazing. And there is the striped hyena. That's found only in East Africa. We don't find them here. Up in East Africa and in North Africa. And there's the aardwolf. And they're much, much smaller. They're sort of probably the size, I don't know, of a, a spaniel. Do you remember, hyenas, although I've compared them with the size of a dog, they are not dogs at all. They're from a totally different family. And they're actually slightly more closely related to cats but they're actually in a family all on their own called the Hyenidae. And all of those four animals live in that same family. But this is the biggest and the most impressive one, the spotted hyena. 
Oh, you can see how the sun is warming them now. And they're just so very happy. The youngsters have had their milk for the day. Now they're just enjoying snoozing in the sun with their mum. And of course they don't have to go to school like you guys, which means that they get to relax and play all day long. It sounds like a good life, don't you think? I always used to think it sounded like a good life when I was at school, across the road there. All righty. Oh. Now, apparently, there's a question here from an, an anonymous student. That's interesting that there should be an anonymous student in your class, everyone. Um, <laughs> that's very interesting indeed. Uh, but your question is good, Miss Anonymous. Miss Anonymous, you want to know if hyenas only eat meat. No, they don't. They only eat meat, but they only eat sort of meat products. So the spotted hyena will eat meat and bones and horns sometimes, and you leave it and sometimes find teeth in their dung, believe it or not. But they have the most powerful jaws of any mammal in Africa. And so what they're able to do is bite through bones. And inside the bones is a delicious stuff called marrow. And I don't know if you've ever had marrow on toast, but it's delicious. And they have marrow, they like the marrow, it's good for them, it's got lots of fat in it. And I know some people will tell you that fat is not good for you, but fat is actually very good for you, especially if you live out here, where it's a, what we call a limiting nutrient. That means there's not enough of it. And so the marrow is a really good source of fat, and hyenas with their big strong jaws are able to get at the marrow inside the bones. Now the brown hyena will eat some fruit even. They will eat the odd bit of fruit if they can find it, as will the striped hyena. And the aardvolf, well, his main food is actually termites and ants. So they don't, while I suppose that you might think of that as meat, it's not quite the same as the meat that the spotted hyena eats. And everyone thinks a spotted hyena is a scavenger, which, you know, I know that you've all seen the Lion King, and you see that all the baddies in the Lion King, of course, are hyenas. Well, hyenas are not really like that. That's not very fair. Hyenas are actually very good hunters. You can see their wonderful mothers. This mother is looking after her babies exactly the same as your mothers look after you. And they're very good hunters. And they actually steal less than male lions do, believe it or not. And they didn't tell you that in the Lion King, did they? You can just see her eyes are very heavy. She wants to have a snooze. So often you mustn't believe what you see on the TV or in stories because hyenas are actually very, very clever. Hello, Kada. Kada, you want to know how many hyenas there are in a group? Well, Kada, it just depends on the group. Um, how best to describe this. This particular group's probably got about 20 hyenas in it, but we know of another group that's just to the west of us on a reserve called Elephant Plains, and that hyena group's got 50 in it. And then there's one down further to the south of us at a place called Londolozi, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, that has at least sort of 30 or 40 hyenas in it. So this is quite a small group of 20, and they're not always together. So you can only see three of them here. We saw the other one in the den and one other sort of sub-adult one, not quite a big adult yet when we came here. But the rest of them will be lying around the place within the territory. So they've got a territory, which means they've got an area that they live in, only they live in it, and they won't have any other hyenas in that area. The rest of the group of the 20 of them will be around the area, lying under bushes and perhaps resting in the sunshine, just like this one is. And then if they find something that they want to steal and they need help stealing it, well, then they'll make a big noise and the others will come and help. Otherwise, they just sort of forage, which means to look for food. They forage around on their own. And I believe you're all going off to towards Delta Park tomorrow. Well, that'll be good. Look out for a brown hyena. See if you can spot a brown hyena there. That would be very, very exciting indeed. 
Right, we're going to head away from here. Brenty has got an animal that looks very similar to this from the shape, but is from a completely different group of animals. Go and have a look. So we've got some wildebeest. And we saw some yesterday as well, but far, far away. Now, wildebeest are quite funny looking creatures. Now, I'm going to see who at Rodine can remember what animal do you sometimes find or quite often find with the wildebeest. And it also eats grass. So why don't you guys tell me what is the other animal you see with wildebeest? And you can see the wildebeest are using this very specific habitat. It's a habitat called a seep line. So that means there's water under the ground here and there's a lot more grass and that's what they're doing. They're eating the grass and wildebeest are very fussy eaters. So they like their grass short and they like very specific species of grass. Now there's the big daddy. So he stays here in this area. He's that territorial male and the females move between different males areas. They're very, very relaxed at the moment, the Vildies. Uh, having a nice morning munch. And then, here we go. Hello, Mr. Vildebeest. So, because it's a drought, we might find some Vildebeest in areas that they not normally are. That. See how he's picking his way between the different species of grass. Hi, Malaria. Malaria is wondering what animal is the biggest threat to a lion. Malaria, other lions are the biggest threat to lions. Uh, very seldom hyenas. But to a male lion, the biggest threat to a male lion is another male lion. We're going to keep moving along here, let the wildebeest have their breakfast. Now, on, in this particular habitat, we have a very, a, one of the types of trees that's very common here is called a terminalia or a custer leaf. Now, I'm sure a few of you are having troubles with your big teeth coming out. Now, baby elephants also have a trouble when their teeth start coming out. And one of the trees they eat when they have trouble with their their, their teeth coming out is this tree, the silver cluster leaf. Now, if I chew these leaves, that's how much I like you because they're not very tasty. What will happen is it'll start numbing my gums. So, so to help the baby elephant when its teeth are hurting and pushing through, they eat these leaves. And you can taste all the tannins and the tannins are what help numb the gums. So also, in the bush a long time ago, when people used to live without modern medicine and that, people also used to chew on these leaves when they had sore teeth. I'm not going to chew on it too much. I don't have any sore teeth. But it doesn't taste nice. Even if you bite in it, it also dries your mouth out. Let's carry on. Now, I am hoping that our leopard luck hasn't run out. But if it has, there's still so many wonderful things out here in the bush that we can show you and talk about. And yesterday we spoke about the termite mound being a habitat in itself. And you can see that all sorts of creatures use termite mounds, like those hyenas you've seen with James. Hi, Grace. Grace would like to know, how big is a male leopard? Uh, in, its, in its height, it's about the same height as a, I'm trying to think, what do you think, an Alsatian. Uh, as a dog, like a police dog, it's about the same height, but it's much heavier, much thicker. So it weighs about, a really big male leopard weighs about the same as me, which is about 90 kilograms. And length, 
without their tail, they're probably about as long as my arms, I think. Oh, there we go. About as long as my arms. But uh, with their tail, obviously, they're much longer. So probably about between one or about 1.8 meters for a big male leopard is his length without his tail. Now, if we can't find any leopards, I think we should look for some elephants. Now, there have been lots of elephants around, tracks all over the place, so hopefully we find some. Hi, Nuha. Nuha would like to know what animals we don't have in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve. Well, in terms of African animals, and we don't have any of the animals that live in a very different habitat called the rainforest. Now, the rainforest is further to the north and west, uh, and most of the rainforest is in a country called Congo, or the Democratic Republic of Congo. So, in those rainforests, you get animals like chimpanzees and gorillas uh, and lots of different monkey species. Let me try and think what else is up in the rainforest that we don't get here. Ooh, lots of things. Lots of different little, little dikers. And they've even got different crocodiles in the rainforest from the ones we get in the bush. And then if we go across to the east of Africa, we've got some gazelles. We don't have any gazelles in the Sabi Sands. Uh, and if you also look to the desert areas, we don't have any chemsbok. And we don't have any springbok, and we don't have any... Vim, can you think of anything else from the deserts? Ah, heart of beast, uh, foxes, cape fox, bat-eared fox. So there are different animals that are designed specifically for different, different habitats. So animals that we get here, you might not get in those habitats. Now, you have some animals that you would call generalists. Almost true desert to the edge of the rainforest. So they are able to generally survive in most habitats. They won't be in the, the driest desert and they won't be in the wettest rainforest. Now, the same goes for birds. Uh, certain birds specialize in certain habitats. Okay, now, let's have a look here. Are there any tracks on the road? No tracks. Oh, there's a track. What was that? Well done, ladies. You are spot on, right on the money. The animal you often find with wildebeest when they're grazing is a zebra. Aren't you You're a clever bunch? So while we keep looking for other animals out here, let's go see what James is up to on the other vehicle. Look, everybody, it's an enormous piece of dung, um, AKA poo. Now, this particular piece of poo As one of the best smells in the bush. Let's give Brian a smell. Brian, would you like a smell? Give a smell. Mm. Ah. Now, I'm not joking, everyone. This is elephant dung, obviously. Look how big it is. It's bigger than my head. See? And elephant dung actually smells very good. And that's because it's got all sorts of different things in it. And an elephant's digestive system, well, you know that if you've, I'm sure you've all seen horses dung before, you probably also picked it up. And it's not smelly at all, it's just grass, basically. But an elephant eats so many different kinds of things. Let's have a look here. See, it's eating sticks. It's eating bits and pieces of gruel. That's actually also a stick. Let's see if we can find some leaves. There we go, it's eating leaves. They'll eat grass, they eat seed pods, they'll eat fruit. And all of that means that when you smell their dung, it's not great when it's just come out, but this dung is probably about two days old. 
and the smell is just so nice. It smells like, you know that feeling you get when the lawn at home has just been mowed and you smell that fresh green grass? It doesn't smell quite like that, but it gives me the same comforting feeling. It smells a little bit like a potpourri. You can ask a teacher what potpourri is. All right, on we go. Let's see what else we can find around the corner here. There's a little water hole. I'm hoping there might be an animal there. Now the animals often a water hole, as you many of you will know, because I'm sure lots of you have been to the Kruger Park. If you come across a water hole and it's very hot, you're likely to see animals there. But we're not very close. It's not very hot today. You can still see I've got my jacket on. It's not as cold as it is in Johannesburg, but it's still quite cold, and so the animals are not coming down to have anything to drink just yet. But there is a bird. Well, let's just have a quick look over here. Here's the little water hole, everyone. And at it, there is something called an emerald spotted wood dove. An emerald spotted wood dove, which I think is a lovely name for a bird. And it's just looking around there for some something to drink. And Timely, you want to know why, there it is, you want to know why hyenas have got a furry skin. Well, Timely, it's the same reason that you wear a jersey. Can you imagine wandering around without a jersey in the middle of winter in Johannesburg? Well, you'll be very cold, wouldn't you? That's why all animals have got fur on their skin. And you'll find the bigger the animal gets in this area, the less fur it has. So a buffalo's got sort of some fur, but not very much. And an elephant has got almost no fur at all. So the bigger you are, the less the cold tends to affect you. The smaller you are, and some of the smallest mammals we get out here are little gerbils. Now a gerbil is like a hamster, if you like, and they live under the ground because they get very cold and they've got very thick fur. And a hyena, of course, somewhere between the size of a gerbil and an elephant. So they have fur just to stay warm. And we are mammals, remember? We, just like the hyenas and the wildebeest that you've seen, and the elephants and all of those sort of things are mammals. And that means that we make our own heat inside us. So we're not like a crocodile or a lizard. You've all seen a lizard lying in the sun, haven't you? And they lie in the sun like that because they have, that's the only way they can stay warm. If they are out of the sun, then their body temperature starts to drop. And then they can't move properly and it's difficult for them to move. But we, much like all of the other mammals out here, we make our own heat inside us. And that's why we have to, it's important for us to maintain that temperature. You know that your temperature is about 36 and a half to 37 degrees. And when your mother says to you, you've got a temperature, it means your temperature's gone too high. Well, it's also very dangerous if your temperature goes too low. And that's why we wear clothes to stay warm and why we stay inside a house. And it's the same, obviously, you can't stay inside a house if you're a little hyena. And so you've got to have thick fur to stay warm. Whereas the reptiles, the lizards and the crocodiles and the snakes, they don't have to worry about that sort of stuff because they are what we call cold-blooded. There's an impala. Sorry, Ambrin, I missed your name, oh, your question. Please, will you send it through again? Oh, you say, why do hyenas have little manes? That's a nice observation, Ambrin. I'm not really sure I know the answer. Here we've got a very interesting little group of animals. We've got one impala, that's the one just behind there, and we've got the rest of them being kudu. Now I'm going to ask you all a question. And I want you to try and send through the answers as quick as you can. Why do you think one male impala would be hanging around with a whole lot of kudus? Why would an impala hang around with some kudus? What do you think the advantage would be? Why is, would it be a good idea for that impala to hang around with all those kudus? So while you think about that, my friend Brent has found something very, very special to show you. Yay, elephants! A little breeding herd of elephants. I can see two moms and two babies. And let me move forward a little bit. The one baby's drinking mom's milk. Oh, 
Now he's finished drinking now. Now it looks like a little boy. Now little boy elephants can be quite fun because they come right up to inspect us. Look at him, he's, he looks like he's on his way to give us an inspection. Hello little mister. Hello little horror. Kader's wondering if I've ever been charged by an elephant. I have quite a few times, Kader, but only really badly once. Normally, you can stop an elephant charge by shouting at them and telling them to behave themselves. They normally listen quite nicely. Now, even though he was drinking milk, he's also at the age where he's starting to eat plants as well, but most of his nutrients will come from his mom's milk. So when they're younger than this, they still have to learn how to use their trunk, the little Ellie's. And you can see how good mom is with her trunk. And she's eating that Dicrostachys or a sickle bush. Now, here we go. See, he's trying to sneak closer to us. Here he is. Hello. And when he puts his nose out, he's actually trying to give us a sniff. Hello, little naughty. So he's about four meters from us at the moment, maybe five. Now, this is very normal little Eddie behavior. They like to sort of sneak up behind you. Well, Ambrin's wondering about elephant toes and why do they have two, not five? Well, they actually do have, uh, I think, yes, they do have five. You know, VM's going to show you the toes. You can actually see the toenails, but you'll only ever be able to see four of the toenails. And the fifth or the thumb is at the back. Now, elephants got a very interesting shape in their feet. So, although it looks like very flat like that, it, they're actually sort of standing on tippy toes at the whole time. Now, inside an elephant's foot, there's a big sponge. Oh, hello, naughty. <laughs> they are very cute little Ellie's. Now, I'll show you with my hand what the inside of an elephant's foot looks like just now. Let's just stick with these Ellie's while they're coming, while this little one's coming closer. Hey, naughty. Now, it's very important when you're with elephants not to watch that, the big females and their behavior. And they give you lots of telltale signs when they're upset. These ones are not upset at all. Their tails are hanging loosely. Uh, and their body language is telling me that they're very, very relaxed. And the little ones often shake their heads at you and trumpet. He, like he, also, he just did it. Hey, naughty. He's, he's bored of us now. So let me just show you what the inside of an elephant's foot looks like quickly. So basically an elephant's got their toes and it sits like this. So there's bones like that, and that's where the toenails are. But inside here is a big sponge. It's like a big sponge because elephant's so heavy, it needs that sponge to take the weight. So it's like a big shock absorber inside, inside an elephant's foot. Oh, there's the other baby over there. So all we can see is two females and two babies. Now, in a little group like this, they will all be related. It's strong possibility, looking at the age of the, f the big females, that they might be sisters. Or if not sisters, definitely cousins. And see how an elephant uses its feet to break things out of the ground? You can just hear the branches breaking all around us from the Ellie's. So when they're, after, when they're eating branches, what they're after is the, the, actually the little layer under the bark. Oh. Oh. They've got such a good sense of smell. You saw it blow out there. Now it's smelling for the different plants that it can eat and that'll be good for it. Oh, hello, Vin. Little one's back giving us the, the ears out.
So these little ones are probably just under two years old. Oh, here we go, we're getting, there we go. Hello, hello trouble, hello naughty. Now that is less than 30 centimeters from the front of the car. <laughs> and here comes mom. <laughs> I heard a little rumble there. I think mom told the little one to behave and stop playing with the car. <laughs> that was so wonderful. Hi, Naha. Uh, Naha is wondering how long elephants live for. Well, Naha, elephants live for about 65 years. They have six sets of teeth over their life, and when their last set of teeth is worn down, uh, that's when they normally uh, die. Very, very cute. Now, we've talked about elephants being able to change the habitat. And if we have a, a broader look around us, you can see this female here is keeping that sickle bush short. And you can, if we come out to the left slightly, slightly then. Now, there's a piece of dead sickle bush there. So these elephants have probably been feeding off the sickle bush for many years. And they don't like sickle bush when they get old and big. So elephants almost farm their favorite trees that they eat to keep them nice and small and short and keep them growing and tasty. Let's just move around, it's walking behind us. Oh, look at him playing, he's sitting on his bum. <laughs> oh, he's just playing. Oh, are the two going to play with each other? This could be fun. Ele young elephants like to wrestle and push each other around quite a bit. So they're not so worried about eating all the time because they're still relying on their mom's milk. Now, George is wondering why do elephants have tusks? Well, in female elephants, Georgia, they help the elephant with their feeding. They use their tusks to take bark off trees, um, and they use their tusks to defend themselves as well. Now, male elephants, they're also used for feeding, but they're more important for fighting. So when they're looking for girlfriends, the male elephants will use those tusks to fight amongst each other like swords, and, and whoever's got the strongest and best tusks and, uh, and the best swordsmen will win all the girlfriends. But they're not feeding off anything that they need their tusks for at the moment but they'll use them to break branches, they'll use them to, uh, as I said, take off bark. I've e they'll even use them to dig out mud. Now, elephants eat quite a bit of mud, but only certain types of mud, mud that's got lots of salt in it, so lots of minerals. So, like, I'm sure your mom and dads make you take vitamins. Look at that, look how strong she is. She's moving a dead branch to get to the grass that's growing underneath that the other animals haven't been able to get to. So she just moved half a tree to get to that grass. It's so nice sitting with elephants. So we're going to leave these Ellies to carry on munching their breakfast uh, while we do that. Let's go back to James, who's got another member of Africa's Big Five. There, everybody, is a buffalo, and it's a small group of buffalo, only six of them. That's quite unusual. There are probably some more through there in the bush, deep down in the bush there. And buffalo are the equivalent, basically, they're like wild cows. And that's not to insult them at all, they're magnificent creatures. But that's what they look like, isn't it? And that's what they smell like, it's how their bodies work. And you know what, you can actually drink buffalo milk, apparently it's quite nice. But you can't milk a buffalo, it's very difficult to milk a buffalo because they're not very friendly to human beings. They get very scared of us very quickly. And you will hear people tell you that buffalo are very dangerous. Now, I want you to remember one thing from today, everyone. I want you to remember that no animal out here is dangerous all the time. Animals are only dangerous 
when they are scared. So you remember that. And if you remember that, and if you don't ever make the animal scared, remember these animals, although they're much bigger than us, although they're much bigger, bigger than us, they are scared of us as human beings. So if I got out of the car, they would run away. And if you get them into a position where you give them a fright and they can't run away, then animals can become dangerous. So please don't go away from this lesson thinking that any animal is dangerous by nature. They aren't, you know. They're by and large, they just want to be peaceful and get on with their lives. <laughs> Some lovely qu answers to my little quiz there about the impala ram and the kudu cows. Gracie, you say, <laughs> you say that that impala ram was looking for girlfriends. He might have been, but those are kudus. They're not impalas, so they're not going to make very good girlfriends to him. They're much bigger than him, and they're different animals entirely. Kada, you say it's for protection, and that's exactly why uh, an impala ram would be around animals of a different kind, because, of course, he can't see everything going on around him. Those kudu will help him to see and hear and smell any predators that might be around. So, yes, that's exactly why the impala ram was with the kudu. It wasn't because he was looking for girlfriends, Gracie. Now you can hear them moving. If I'm going to be very quiet, so everybody sit very, very quietly now. Sit very still and just listen quietly. There you could hear all sorts of interesting things. You could hear the Franklins calling. And you could hear the buffalo's feet falling on the dry leaves. You could also maybe hear them pulling the grass out of the ground. Now, when you're out here, you've got to be listening carefully all the time because your ears are a very good way of telling what's just around the corner. What's not, your ears cannot often hear, is a spider. Let's go and see a spider with Brent. So, we've talked about habitats being everything, and even the smallest things can be a habitat. So what I've done is I've gone and found this dead log next to me, and I've, it was a loose piece of bark, and I've taken it off. And we can see here, I don't know if you, can you see him, Vim? or her actually, it's a lady. Now that is the most poisonous spider, or venomous spider, sorry, we get out here. It's called a violin spider. And they often live under the dead bark, and you can see it looks quite similar to a daddy long legs. So they often live there, and they catch all sorts of little ho-hos that come inside. Now, I don't know if we're gonna see them over here. So there's a stick insect that the violin spider, spider has caught. So it's probably eaten all the insides of that little stick insect out, and that's just the remnants left behind. But as I said, we're talking about habitats. Now here we have something, and if any of you have silkworm worms at home, doesn't that look a lot like a silkworm casing? Oh, got a fright. I thought there was a scorpion on my arm. Scorpions also live like this. Something just jumped out. There's a little bit of bark. <laughs> uh, but there we go. So there you see that. Now that's probably from a moth. So the caterpillar has gone into a cocoon under here and it's a nice safe place for it to, for the, the moth or, or butterfly to, to come out from. So it's amazing. If you look closely, there are little habitats everywhere. So in your garden, there's going to be multiple habitats. Uh, if you start looking under the bark or even under the grass, there's going to be a different habitat. But anyway, we're going to go put this back so all the creatures there uh, can be safe where they were. I'm just going to be careful that I don't squish the poor spider. It should be fine. So, there we go. Oh, wrong way around. Put it the right way around. There we go. So that's how I found it. So even just under a dead piece of wood, there's a whole habitat with lots of different little species that are living there. I'm 
Okay, let's go look for some more habitats and animals that live in them. Hi, Mia. Mia would like to know, do we ever see reptiles? We do, Mia, but it's quite cold this morning, and reptiles are cold-blooded. So they like hot days to move around, but we see lots of different reptiles. We see snakes sometimes. Viam actually had a snake nearly fall on him on the car. Um, our aerial hit a branch and a little spotted bush snake fell out and landed next to him. Uh, we also see lots of geckos and uh, lizards. And from the biggest lizard we get here, a monitor lizard, which can be as long as me, to tiny geckos that, can, that are as big as my fingernails. Lots of different reptiles. They are quite hard to see from the car. When we see reptiles, we're normally walking through the bush. But we're going to keep checking for habitats while we do that. Let's go to James, who's got one of the most beautiful birds in the bush. And beautiful it is indeed. There, everybody, is a lilac breasted roller. And isn't he just so beautiful? So he will eat some of those. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. He will eat some of those uh, spiders that you've just been seeing with Brent, if he can get hold of them. But mostly, he will grab things off the ground, like grasshoppers. Now let's just see where he flies. There, he's flown up to the top of a dead tree over there. There. And he's looking for grasshoppers on the ground and they fly down, grab them and then fly up to a perch like where he's sitting and then they'll eat what they've caught. And you can see him looking down all the time. Now this is a very interesting bird because as you many of you will know, with birds that are colourful, often it's only the males that are colourful and often the females are not. So if you think of sunbirds, which are very colourful males and very drab or dull females, same as a peacock. I'm sure you all know what a peacock is. They've got a big bright tail that's many, many colours and the female doesn't have anything like the same thing. The lilac breasted roller is different. Both the male and the female are that beautiful colour and lilac you know is a colour that looks a bit like purple. The breast, of course, is the front, is the chest of the bird, and so that's why it's called a lilac breasted. And a roller, if you watch him fly, I don't think he's going to do it for us though, they do all sorts of interesting things when they fly. They roll around in the sky, and that's why they're called rollers. Lilac breasted roller. Let's carry on, see what else we can spot. Now this poor tree over here, well, unfortunately, it's dead. And of course, many of the trees out here will die and then others will grow. But this one, we don't, we think we know why it died. Now you all love elephants. You've all seen that elephant that Brent was showing you. And you all saw the tusks on the elephant. Now, what happened here was that an elephant, probably during the winter time like now, came along here, and I know it looks like oh, this is a bit of a climb to get up here, but elephants are actually very good climbers. What the elephant did was it took the bark, remember this is the bark, Brent showed you the bark that he pulled off that tree. Well, the elephant would have taken the bark off all the way around. All the way around the tree like this, it would have pulled the bark off, and that means the death of the tree, because Remember, trees get their nutrients, their water and their food from two places. One, in the ground, they've got their roots in the ground, and two, in their leaves. Now, trees can make sugar from the sun and from water and from the air, the carbon dioxide in the air, which you'll learn about later on. But they make that in the leaves, and that comes down to the bottom, and then the roots send up all sorts of vitamins and minerals into the rest of the plant. But they've all got to travel inside the bark. And inside the bark they have veins. You know like if you look at your wrist, 
If you look down at your wrist, you've got those things called veins there. Those veins move the blood around your body. Well, the tree's got a similar thing, and that's all under the bark. So if you take the bark off a tree like this, all the veins are gone, which means that the water and the vitamins can't go up to the top, and the sugar can't go down to the bottom, and so the tree will eventually die, and it'll become firewood. And while that's quite a sad story, if you happen to be a tree, it's not a sad story for many other animals because now living inside here we've got all sorts of beetles and wasps and probably various other things and things like woodpeckers which are you know what a woodpecker is a bird that comes and pecks they come and drill holes in the side and they eat the beetle larva and they eat the wood boring bees and so although the tree is dead it's providing life for all sorts of other creatures which I think is very clever. Nature is very, very clever. And you know when you even, oh look, we've still got some elephant dung here. Even when you are, even that elephant dung will provide a little bit of a home for some termites. So when you're in the bush, you know, and you, you uh, the elephant's blood, once it's come out of the ears, flows into the brain and it keeps it nice and cool. I can't hear exactly what brings it home. Thirsty go away bird. Two thirsty go away birds. A, a reptile. And there we go. There he is. Just his little head sticking out of the water. Looks like a hinged terrapin. He's swimming around. As it warms up, they're going to get more active. Now, that's his habitat. He needs water to survive. And he eats all sorts of little hohos that live in the water. This is spoiled. I'm just take that out. Where? On the side of the... On the rubber, I just make a move. I didn't hear it. Sorry. There. Yeah. Go have a look. Sorry about that, we're back. While we were sitting at the little water hole there, a VM heard a squirrel alarm calling, and earlier I said your ears when you're in the bush. I know James has talked about it as well. So if a squirrel sees, a squirrel sees something that can impala, he shouts at it. So he's going leopard. He shouts to get a leopard, but because he's so small, squirrels will shout it almost everything, a mongoose, uh, a big bird of prey like an eel. Now everybody, we've come along. I'm not sure if we're still with Rodine or not. Louise, are we still with Rodine? Don't know. Okay, well, we've got two interesting things here. We've got a buffalo and we've got a whole lot of wildebeest. Let me say that again. I nearly said wildebeest and then I didn't want to say wildebeest. And so we've got wildebeest and a buffalo. Now, they're not the same thing. Uh, contrary to popular belief, there is the enormous buffalo. And I do know what, I mean, they can look the same in some situations. But when you see them standing together, that enormous buffalo bull is probably twice the size of one of these wildebeest. And what's interesting here is that for the same reason that that impala ram was lurking about with the kudu, so this buffalo bull is hanging around with 
the wildebeest herd. Many eyes, many ears, many noses looking out for predators all over the place. Now, my good friend Brian on the back of the vehicle here very cleverly spotted something in the distance. Now, I just want to show you how good Brian is at spotting things. Pia, while we do that, there it is. You see that, everybody? Look who's hiding behind the bushes there. He's a big elephant bull. Lots of animals in this area. It's wonderful. Pierre, you want to know how long a wildebeest lives for? I think you'll probably find a wildebeest can live up to about 15 or 16 years. And again, if they lived in captivity, they would live for a bit longer. Because out here, when you get a bit old, well, you know what happens. You don't kind of uh, retire like we do as human beings. If you get a bit old out here, a lion will normally find you and then eat you. Because you're not quite as fast as you once were when you were young. So we've got three different mammal species here. There's a beautiful big elephant bull. In fact, there are a few elephants in there. And we've got some wildebeest and we've got some buffalo. Look at this buffalo in front of us here. See him there? He's a big bull. About 800 kilograms, everybody. Now, I know that you're about eight years old each, so you probably weigh mm, about 30 kilograms each, which means that that buffalo weighs as much as 20, about 30 of you. Almost as much as your whole class, everyone. So you can imagine your whole class gathered together, put on a scale, you weigh the same as that one big buffalo bull. Isn't that amazing? We can, there's a little road down there. I'm going to suggest we go down that little road. Let's see if we can get a bit of a closer look at those elephants. And it's a very beautiful day now. The wind has stopped blowing and the sun is out. Although it's still winter, it's still very nice out here. And you know it's warmer down here in what we call the low felt. We're much lower down. You and Johannesburg there at Rodine, especially on the Houghton Ridge there. You know St. John's is possibly the coldest place in Johannesburg. I was at school there for 12 years. It was very cold during the winter. Uh, it's about 1,600 meters above sea level. Now over here in the low felt, we're only about 450 meters above sea level, which means it's much warmer. It doesn't ever get as cold as it does where you are. Ah, everybody, the school is not with us, but we are still having a wonderful time with the animals here. We've got the buffalo, we've got the wildebeest, and there's some warthogs. This is actually rather splendid, isn't it, Brian? Mm. Splendid. Warties, Vildies, Buffies, Ellies, Trees, Birdies, Insecties. Let's just roll slowly forward. I think this is wonderful. There's a great plethora of animals. So our stream did go down, everyone. I'm sorry about that, but I think we're okay now. And that should all be sorted out by the end. Oh, light's all wrong. That's it. Look at me. Oh, the camera won't even focus on him. Come on, look here. Come on. Totally blurry. Going to delete it. Not even going to show you. It's so embarrassing. Now, oh, quite a uh, the school driver. School is apparently about to rejoin us, everybody. So we'll go through the sighting with them. Of happy wildebeest 
frolicking warthogs and elephants as well. Okay, let's move on down the road here. We'll just ease forward. I want to see if we can't get a view of those warthogs for the kids. Louise, has there got the kids with us yet? Right, hello guys. Ooh, now, we've just come down here. There are a whole lot of wildebeest all over the place. There are some warthogs up ahead and there's also an elephant not too far from here. I just don't want to move too far closely to those warthogs because they do run away quite a lot and I don't know why they're so nervous of us. But they're one of my favorites, aren't they lovely? Look at those tusks looking at us through the bush there. That'll be the mother warthog. Her little babies are just through the bush in front of her. Let's, we're going to just roll slowly forward and then I'm going to show you the elephant that my friend Brian managed to spot from a very long way away. I don't want the car to make too much noise and give them a fright. Got to be very, very patient when you work out here. If you want to see animals, very patient, very quiet. There we go. They seem quite happy now. So that's a sow. That's what we call a female pig and her piglets. And these are very closely related to the pigs that you've probably seen before. Many of you will have been to the bush and seen warthogs before. We call a female a sow and the babies piglets. And you can see those noses exactly the same as the noses of a domestic pig. And it's turned into the most magnificent morning. That's the sound of a magpie shrike that you can hear behind us. Dove off to the side. Paw, 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 paw. It's always like this when the sun comes out. Everything feels very peaceful here, unless it's summertime, in which case it's very hot. Now, when you go around the corner here, we can start the car. There we are. And around the corner, there is an elephant. I'm going to duck out the way. There's quite a few bushes on this road. Watch out there, Brian. Brian's very tall. I'm lucky I just duck underneath them. And there are a whole lot of elephants, actually, and a buffalo. Elephants and buffalo making friends with each other. I'll just try and get into a nice position where we can see them all. The pigs aren't running away, which is brilliant. They're all very close by to us now, only a few meters away. And there we are. We've got warthogs here, very close by to us. And just look at the female there. She's chewing, and you can you see the teeth on the bottom there? There we are. Those teeth there are so sharp, they're like razors, the bottom ones. So the top ones are actually quite blunt, but the bottom ones, because she rubs them against the top ones all the time, they are very, very, very sharp. She's done very well. She's obviously a very good mother, this warthog, because she's got one, two, three, four, four little piglets from one litter, 
And then that other bigger one that the behind there could well be also hers, or it might be an unrelated one who's just living with her. A wonderful sighting. And Josephine, you're in New York, not at Rodine School for Young Girls, and you want to know how long a warthog can live for. I think you'll find a warthog will struggle to live beyond 10 years, uh, but probably more likely eight. Also, I'm not exactly sure what the longevity is of a warthog, but I'd say about eight years. Again, in captivity, they will live a little bit longer. And there are some elephants there, just down through the bushes. There we are. And everything really does feel like it's the whole world has breathed out. It's taken a deep sigh of relief. <sighs> because it's just so nice and warm and so pleasant to be out here now. See the tusks there? Those are the tusks that would have been used to strip that scotia or weeping boar bean tree that we saw earlier. And Jilly in the United Kingdom, you know, want to know if an elephant would ever leave its herd and go off with another herd. Well, absolutely they would, especially if it was a bull. So the bulls don't stay in the natal herd. They have to leave their herds when they're about 17 years old. They become rambunctious like a 17-year-old human being and their mothers and aunts will toss them out of the herd and they can go and join a little group of bulls together. Um, they may sort of trail uh, another, another female herd every so often, but they will go and live on their own. Then it's unlikely that a female born into a herd will migrate to another herd with totally unrelated females. It's unlikely. I'm pretty sure it would have happened. And I guess one of the examples of it happening would be that if a, an orphaned elephant was found by a herd of unrelated elephants, which is unlikely, but were it to happen, and were there to be a lactating female within that herd, it's highly likely that the orphan would be adopted. But they don't migrate as a matter of course between herds, no. Isn't that lovely? I just think the colours at this time of the year are rather delightful, that yellow and gold mixed with the grey. Hmm. Rather peaceful, isn't it, Brian? Mm. Mm. All around us, life exploding despite the fact that it's winter. So very unlike, I guess, a northern hemisphere winter where there's snow and ice on the ground. And there we are. Let's turn around and then we'll head back out and have a look at the wildebeest again with their friends, the buffalo. And I don't think you were with us when I was explaining. Um, just like, remember we saw the impala and we saw them with the kudu. Now we've got a similar situation here where we've got the buffalo hanging around with the elephants and we also had a buffalo bull up here with a whole lot of wildebeest. And hanging around with the wildebeest for exactly the same reason as that impala was hanging around with the kudu. Ooh. That is that is going to be a problem. We've just hit something quite heavy, I think. I'm not sure we're going to be able to reverse off it. No. Louise, I think you might have to go across to Brent to get an update from him. We'll see you just now. Tsk, tsk, Master Hendry. I'm sure James will be off there in not too long. So, we're back with Vim and myself. And it's nearly the end of the sunrise safari. And it has been an interesting one. 
Nice to see that Cindy is moving again, so there's a good chance you're going to see him in all over the weekend. Maybe he'll pop in for Saturday. Catty I am going to be departing uh, today for a short while. I'm going to be going on leave, but I will be back. Don't worry. I'm going to, go, I'm going to be down on the coast. You go to a wedding, do some fishing. Maybe sleep in a few mornings. Joking. Uh, it's a funny thing. When you wake up, the times we wake up every day, your body clock is so entrenched that when you want to sleep in, <laughs> you can't. You end up lying in bed, tossing and turning. So rather than doing that, I always just like to get up. The one funny thing about when you are on leave and you're with people outside of the crew is that outside of the bush, everyone tends to go to bed quite late. <laughs> and you find yourself sort of nodding off at, at dinner parties and whatnot. Looks like the cold front might be coming back. The temperature just dropped in the last 10 minutes. Hi, Virginia, who's in Kentucky. Virginia says they're having severe weather warnings, including tornado warnings uh, at the moment at home, but I'm wondering if we ever get that here. I think there's only been two recorded cases of uh, major tornadoes in South Africa in, in a couple of hundred years. So no, uh, we get dust devils, sort of small, small versions, but nothing really that uproots trees and removes roofs from houses and that. So we're quite lucky. It's a very stable sort of weather. We don't really get, well, we occasionally get down, uh, downpours and floods from tropical cyclones off the Mozambique coast, <coughs> but nothing really, really as scary as earthquakes or tornadoes. But I'm going to say goodbye and uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And uh, well, for the last few min minutes of drive, let's go see how James got unstuck from the stump. Yes, I, I, I got off the stump, everybody. It was a, it was a very well-hidden stump, uh, very small, uh, very unobvious, very difficult to see. In actual fact, it was an enormous piece of tree sticking out of the ground that I just failed to notice. I'm not sure why I failed to notice it, um, but I did. But we got off it, and we seemed to be okay. We, and I think the accident looked a lot worse than it was. There was a white crowned shrike there, and there's also a grey hornbill. Now, the much more common version is the red billed and yellow billed hornbill. And if you ever go to the bush and your guide says to you, there is a banana bird or a chili bird, when referring to the red and yellow billed hornbill, you must immediately fire him and get another guide. This one was known as the salt and pepper bird. <laughs> Dreadful. And that one has got such a plaintive whistle. You know, the red build and yellow build make that kind of uh, noise. Isn't it? Pretty good, huh? There we go. <laughs> That's Brian. That one makes a very plaintive whistling sound. That's all of the, um, that's all of the uh, hornbill calls that we do out here. <laughs> now, I don't know the girls are still with us. Brian, will you quickly give them the ground hornbill? Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go.
you to the final control of Luisi and Chelsea Bun. And of course, a big thanks to Brent Leo Smith, a well deserved rest he's going to take now. He was being filmed, if I'm not mistaken, by Viam Doren Brach. Now, making his world premiere today, this afternoon, Byron Sorau of Johannesburg. And Byron, of course, uh, was very much looking forward to seeing you. So please do welcome him and be very nice to him today. See you at three.